This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Ulysses by James Joyce, Part 2, The Odyssey, Episode 14, Oxen of the Sun, Part 1. Deshil holes eamus. Deshil holes eamus. Deshil holes eamus. Send us bright one, light one, whore horn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whore horn, quickening and womb fruit. Send us bright one, light one, whore horn, quickening and womb fruit. Hoopsa, boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa, boy a boy, hoopsa. Hoopsa, boy a boy, hoopsa. Universally, that person's acumen is esteemed very little perceptive concerning whatsoever matters are being held as most profitably by mortals with sapience endowed, to be studied who is ignorant of that which the most in doctrine erudite, and certainly by reason of that in them high minds ornament deserving of veneration, constantly maintain, when by general consent they affirm that other circumstances being equal, by no exterior splendor, is the prosperity of a nation more efficaciously asserted than by the measure of how far forward may have progressed the tribute of its solicitude for that proliferant continuance which of evils the original, if it be absent when fortunately present, constitutes the certain sign of omnipotent nature's incorrupted benefaction. For who is there who anything of some significance has apprehended, but is conscious that that exterior splendor may be the surface of a downward-tending, lutulent reality, or on the contrary any one so is there unilluminated as not to perceive that, as no nature's boon can contend, against the bounty of increase, so it behooves every most just citizen to become the exhortator and admonisher of his semblables and to tremble lest what had in the past been by the nation excellently commenced might be in the future not with similar excellence accomplished if an invericund habit shall have gradually traduced the honorable by ancestors transmitted customs to that thither of profundity that that one was audacious excessively who would have the hardihood to rise affirming that no more odious offense can for any one be than to oblivious neglect to consign that evangel simultaneously command and promise which on all mortals with prophecy of abundance or with diminutions menace that exalted of reiteratedly procreating function ever irrevocably enjoined it is not why therefore we shall wonder if as the best historians relate among the celts who nothing that was not in its nature admirable admired, the art of medicine shall have been highly honored. Not to speak of hostels, leper yards, sweating chambers, plague graves, their greatest doctors, the O'Shiels, the O'Hickies, the O'Lees, have sedulously set down the diverse methods by which the sick and the relapsed found again health, whether the malady had been the trembling withering or loose boyconnel flux. Certainly in every public work, which in it anything of gravity contains preparation, should be with importance commensurate, and therefore a plan was by them adopted, whether by having preconsidered, or as the maturation of experience, it is difficult in being said, which the discrepant opinions of subsequent inquirers are not up to the present congrued to render manifest, whereby maternity was so far from all accident possibility removed that whatever care the patient in that all hardest of woman hour chiefly required and not solely for the copiously opulent but also for her who not being sufficiently moneyed scarcely and often not even scarcely could subsist valiantly and for an inconsiderable emolument was provided to her nothing already then and thenceforward was any way able to be molestful for this chiefly felt all citizens except with proliferant mothers prosperity at all not to can be and as they had received eternity god's mortals generation to befit them her beholding when the case was so hoving itself parturient in vehicle thereward 
carrying desire immense among all one another was impelling on of her to be received into that domicile. O oh, thing of prudent nation, not merely in being seen, but also even in being related worthy of being praised, that they her by anticipation went seeing mother, that she by them suddenly to be about to be cherished had been begun, she felt. Before born, bliss babe had. Within womb, one he worship. Whatever in that one case done, commodiously done, was. A couch by midwives, attended with wholesome food reposeful, cleanest swaddles as though forth-bringing were now done, and by wise foresight set. But to this, no less of what drugs, there is need in surgical implements which are pertaining to her case, not omitting aspect of all very distracting spectacles, in various latitudes by our terrestrial orb, offered together with images, divine and human, the cogitation of which by sejunct females is to tumescence conducive, or eases issue in the high sunbright, well-built fair home of mothers, when, ostensibly far gone and reproductive, it is come by her thereto to lie in her term up. Some man that wayfaring was stood by house door at night's oncoming. Of Israel's folk was that man that on earth wandering far had fared. Stark Ruth of man his errand that him lone led till that house. Of that house a horn is lord. Seventy beds keeps he there, teeming mothers are wont that they lie for to thole and bring forth bairns, hail so God's angel to Mary quoth. Watchers tway their walk, white sisters in ward sleepless. Smarts they still, sickness soothing. In twelve moons, thrice an hundred. Trust bed thanes they twain are, for horn holding wariest ward. In ward wary the watcher hearing come, that man mild-hearted eft rising, with swire ye wimple to her gate, wide undid. Lo, leaven leaping lightens in eye blink Ireland's westward welkin. Full she dread that God the reeker all mankind would fordo with water for his evil sins. Christ's rood made she on breastbone, and him drew that he would wrath in fair under her thatch, that man her will wotting worthful went in Horn's house. Loath to irk in Horn's hall, hat holding the seeker stood. On her stow he e'er was living with dear wife and lovesome daughter, that then over land and sea floor nine years had long outwandered. Once her in town hithe meeting, he to her bow had not doffed. Her to forgive now he craved with good ground of her allowed, that that of him swift seen face hers so young then had looked. Light swift her eyes kindled, bloom of blushes his word winning. As her eyes then on got his weeds, swart therefore sorrow she feared, glad after she was that e'er a dread was. Her he asked if O'Hare doctor tidings sent from far coast, and she with grameful sigh him answered that O'Hare doctor in heaven was. Sad was the man that word to hear that him so heavied in bowels ruthful, all she there told him, ruing death for friends so young, all gate sore unwilling God's right wiseness to withsay. She said that he had a fair sweet death, through God his goodness with mass priest to be shriven, holy household and sick men's oil to his limbs. The man then right earnest asked the nun of which death the dead man was died, and the nun answered him and said that he was died in Mona Island, through belly crab three year agone come children mass, and she prayed to God the all ruthful to have his dear soul in undeathliness. He heard her sad words, in held hat sad staring. So stood they there both a while in one hope sorrowing one with another. Therefore every man look to that last end that is thy death, and the dust that grippeth on every man that is born of woman. For as he came naked forth from his mother's womb, so naked shall he wend him at the last for to go as he came. The man that was come into the house then spoke to the nursing woman, 
and he asked her how it fared with the woman that lay there in childbed. The nursing woman answered him, and said that that woman was in throes now full three days, and that it would be a hard birth, enough to bear, but that now in a little it would be. She said there, too, that she had seen many births of women, but never was none so hard as was that woman's birth. Then she set it all forth to him, for because she knew the man, that time was had lived nigh that house. The man hearkened to her words, for he felt with wonder woman's woe in the travail that they have of motherhood, and he wondered to look on her face that was a fair face for any man to see, but yet was she left after long years a handmaid. Nine twelve blood flows chiding her childless. And whilst they spake, the door of the castle was opened, and there nighed them a mickle noise, as of many that sat there at meat. And there came against the place as they stood a young learning knight, yclept Dixon. And the traveller Leopold was couth to him sithen it had happed, that they had had ado each with other in the house of Misericord, where this learning knight lay by cause, the traveller Leopold came there to be healed, for he was sore wounded in his breast, by a spear wherewith a horrible and dreadful dragon was smitten him, for which he did do make a salve of volatile salt and chrism as much as he might suffice. And he said now that he should go into that castle for to make merry with them that were there. And the traveller Leopold said that he should go other whither, for he was a man of cautels and a subtile. And the lady was of his office and reprieved the learning knight though she trowed well that the traveller had said thing that was false for his subtlety. But the learning knight would not hear say nay, nor do her maiden meant, nay have him in aught contrarious to his list, and he said how it was a marvellous castle. And the traveller Leopold went into the castle for to rest him for a space, being sore of limb after many marches, environing in diverse lands, and sometime venery. And in the castle was set a board that was of the birchwood of Finlandy, and it was upheld by four dwarf men of that country, but they durst not move more for enchantment. And on this board were frightful swords and knives that are made in a great cavern by swinking demons out of white flames that they fix then in the horns of buffaloes and stags that there abound marvelously. And there were vessels that are wrought by magic of Mahound out of sea sand, and the air by a warlock with his breath that he blazes into them like two bubbles. And full fair cheer and rich was on the board that no white could devise a fuller and a richer. And there was a vat of silver that was moved by craft to open, in the which lay strange fishes without in heads, though misbelieving men nigh that this be possible thing, without that they see it nevertheless they are so. And these fishes lie in an oily water brought there from Portugal land, because of the fatness that therein is like to the juices of the olive press. And also it was a marvel to see in that castle how by magic they make a compost out of fecund wheat kidneys, out of Chaldee, that by aid of certain angry spirits that they do into it swells up wondrously like to a vast mountain. And they teach the serpents there to entwine themselves up on long sticks out of the ground, and of the scales of these serpents they brew out a brewage like to mead. And the learning knight let pour for child Leopold a draught, and halp thereto the while all they that were there drank every each. And child Leopold did up his beaver for to pleasure him, and took apertly somewhat in amity, for he never drank no manner of mead, which he then put by, and anon full privily he voided the more part in his neighbor glass, and his neighbor niss not of this while. And he sat down in that castle with them for to rest him there a while, thanked be Almighty God. This, meanwhile, this good sister stood by the door and begged them at the reverence of Jesu, our altar liege lord, to leave their wassailing, for there was above one quick with child, a gentle dame, whose time hide fast. Sir Leopold heard on this up-floor cry on high, and he wondered what cry, that it was whether of child or woman, and I marvel, said he, that it be not come or now. Meseems it dureth over long. And he was ware, and saw a franklin that 
hight Linehan on that side the table that was older than any of the tother, and for that they both were knights virtuous in the one emprise, and eke by cause that he was elder, he spoke to him full gently. But, said he, or it be long, too, she will bring forth by God his bounty, and have joy of her childing, for she hath waited marvellous long. And the Franklin that had drunken said, expecting each moment to be her next. Also he took the cup that stood to for him, for him needed, never none asking, nor desiring of him to drink. And now drink, said he, fully delectably, and he quaffed as far as he might to their both's health, for he was a passing good man of his lustiness. And Sir Leopold, that was the goodliest guest that ever sat in Scholar's Hall, and that was the meekest man, and the kindest that ever laid husbandly hand under hen, and that was the very truest knight of the world, one that ever did minion service to lady gentle, pledged him courtly in the cup. Woman's woe with wonder pondering. Now let us speak of that fellowship that was there to the intent to be drunken, and they might. There was a sort of scholars among either side the board, that is to wit Dixon Yclep, Jr. of St. Mary Merciables, with other his fellows Lynch and Madden, scholars of medicine, and the Franklin that hight Lenahan, and one from Albalonga, one Crothers, and young Stephen that had Mayan of a frere that was at head of the board, and Costello that men clep and punch Costello, all long of a mastery of him erewhile jested. And of all them, reserved young Stephen, he was the most drunken that demanded still of more mead, and beside the meek Sir Leopold. But on young Malachi they waited for that he promised to have come, and such as intended to no goodness said how he had broke his avow. And Sir Leopold sat with them, for he bore fast friendship to Sir Simon, and to this his son young Stephen, and for that his languor becalmed him there after longest wanderings, insomuch as they feasted him for that time in the honorablest manner. Ruth read him, love led on, with will to wander, loath to leave. For they were right witty scholars, and he heard their arrow sounds, each gen other as touching birth and righteousness, young Madden maintaining that put such case it were hard the wife to die, for so it had fallen out a matter of some year gone with a woman of Iblana in Horn's house that now was trespassed out of this world, and the self knight next before her death all leeches and apothecaries had taken counsel of her case. And they said farther she should live, because in the beginning, they said, the woman should bring forth in pain, and wherefore they that were of this imagination affirmed how young Madden had said truth, for he had conscience to let her die. And not few, and of these was young Lynch, were in doubt that the world was now right evil governed as it was never other, howbeit the mean people believed it otherwise, but the law nor his judges did provide no remedy. A redress, God grant. This was scant said, but all cried with one acclaim, Nay, by our virgin mother the wife should live and the babe to die. In color whereof they waxed hot upon that head, what with argument, and what for their drinking, but the Franklin Lenahan was prompt, each went to pour them ale, so that at the least way mirth might not lack. Then young Madden showed all the whole affair, and said how that she was dead, and how for holy religion's sake, by reed of Palmer and Bettisman, and for a vow, he had made to St. Alton of Abercan, her good man husband, would not let her death, whereby they were all wondrous grieved. To whom young Stephen had these words following, Murmur, sirs, is eke oft among lay folk. Both babe and parent now glorify their maker, the one in limbo gloom, the other in purge fire. But, Gramercy, what are those God-possible souls that we nightly impossibilize? Which is the sin against the Holy Ghost, very God, Lord and giver of life. For, sirs, he said, our lust is brief. We are means to those small creatures within us, and nature has other ends than we. Then said Dixon, Jr., to Punch Costello, wist he what ends. But he had overmuch drunken, and the best word he could have of him was that he would ever dishonest a woman, whoso she were or wife or maid or leman, if it so fortuned him to be delivered of his spleen of lusty head. Whereat Crothers of Albalonga sang young Malachi's praise of that beast the unicorn, how once in the millennium he cometh by his horn, the other all this while, pricked forward with their jibes wherewith they did malice him, 
witnessing all, and several by St. Fountainous his engines, that he was able to do any manner of thing that lay in man to do. Thereat laughed they all right jocundly, only young Stephen and Sir Leopold, which never durst laugh to open by reason of a strange humor, which he would not bewray, and also for that he rude for her that bare whoso she might be, or wheresoever. Then spake young Stephen, Orgulus of Mother Church, that would cast him out of her bosom, of law of canons, of Lilith, patron of abortions, of bigness wrought by wind of seeds of brightness, or by potency of vampires mouth to mouth, or, as Virgilius saith, by the influence of the Occident, or by the reek of moonflower, or enchilai with a woman which her man has but lain with, effecto secuto, or peradventure in her bath according to the opinions of Averroes and Moses Maimonides. He said also how at the end of the second month a human soul was infused, and how in all our holy mother foldeth ever souls for God's greater glory, whereas that earthly mother, which was but a dam to bear beastly, should die by cannon, for so saith he that holdeth the fisherman's seal, even that blessed Peter, on which rock was holy church for all ages founded. All they bachelors then asked of Sir Leopold, would he in like case so jeopard her person as risk life to save life? A wariness of mind, he would answer as fit at all, and, laying hand to jaw, he said dissembling, as his wont was, that, as it was informed him, who had ever loved the art of physic as might a layman, and agreeing also with his experience of so seldom seen an accident, it was good for that mother church belike at one blow, had birth and death, pence and in such sort delivery, he scaped their questions. That is truth, party, said Dixon, and, or I err, a pregnant word. Which hearing young Stephen was a marvellous glad man, and he averred that he who stealeth from the poor lendeth to the Lord, for he was of a wild manner when he was drunken, and that he was now, in that taking it appeared eftsoons. But Sir Leopold was passing grave, Mogre his word, by cause he still had pity of the terror-causing shrieking of shrill women in their labor, and as he was minded of his good lady Marian, that had borne him an only man-child, which on his eleventh day on live had died, and no man of art could save, so dark is destiny. And she was wondrous stricken of heart for that evil hap, and for his burial did him on a fair corslet of lamb's wool, the flower of the flock, lest he might perish utterly and lie akeeled, for it was then about the midst of the winter. And now Sir Leopold, that had of his body no man-child for an heir, looked upon him his friend's son, and was shut up in sorrow for his forepast happiness, and as sad as he was that him failed a son of such gentle courage, for all accounted him of real parts, so grieved he also in no less measure for young Stephen, for that he lived riotously with these wastrels, and murdered his goods with whores. About that present time young Stephen filled all cups that stood empty, so as there remained but little mo, if the prudenter had not shadowed their approach from him that still plied it very busily, who, praying for the intentions of the sovereign pontiff, he gave them for a pledge the vicar of Christ, which also, as he said, is vicar of Bray. Now drink we, quod he, of this mazer, and quaff ye this mead, which is not indeed parcel of my body, but my soul's bodiment. Leave ye fraction of bread to them that live by bread alone. Be not afeard neither for any want, for this will comfort more than the other will dismay. See ye here, and he showed them glistening coins of the tribute, and goldsmith notes the worth of two pound nineteen shilling that he had, he said, for a song which he writ. They all admired to see the foresaid riches in such dearth of money as was here before. And his words were then these as followeth. Know all men, he said, time's ruins build eternity's mansions. What means this? Desire's wind blasts the thorn tree, but after it becomes from a bramble bush to be a rose upon the root of time. Mark me now. In woman's womb, word is made flesh. But in the spirit of the Maker all flesh that passes becomes the word that shall not pass away. This is the post-creation. Omnis caro ad te veniet. No question but her name is Puissant, who aventried the dear course of our Agenbeyer, 
Healer and Herd, our mighty mother and mother most venerable, and Bernardus saith aptly that she hath an omnipotentium dei parai supplicum, that is to wit, an almightiness of petition, because she is the second Eve, and she won us, saith Augustine too, whereas that other, our grandam, which we are linked up with by successive anastomosis of navel cords, sold us all, seed, breed, and generation, for in a penny pippin. But here is the matter now, or she knew him, that second, I say, and was but creature of her creature, Vergine madre filia di tua filio, or she knew him not, and then stands she in the one denial or ignorancy which Peter Piscator, who lives in the house that Jack built, and with Joseph the joiner, patron of the happy demise, all unhappy marriages. Parce que Monsieur Leo Taxil nu a dit que qui l'avait misé dans cette fichue position, c'était le sacre position ventre de Dieu. Antwader, transubstantiality, odeur, consubstantiality, but in no case, subsubstantiality. And all cried out upon it for a very scurvy word. A pregnancy without joy, he said, a birth without pangs, a body without blemish, a belly without bigness. Let the lewd with faith and fervor worship. With will will we withstand, with say. Hereupon Punch Costello dinged with his fist upon the board, and would sing a bawdy catch, stabu stabella, about a wench that was put in pod of a jolly swashbuckler in Almany, which he did straightways now attack. The first three months she was not well, stabu, when here Nurse Quigley from the door angrily bid them, Hist, ye should shame you, nor was it not meet, as she remembered them, being her mind was to have all orderly against Lord Andrew came for because she was jealous that no gastful turmoil might shorten the honor of her guard. It was an ancient and a sad matron of a sedate look and Christian walking, in habit done beseeming her megrims and wrinkled visage, nor did her hortative want of it affect, for incontinently Punch Costello was of them all embraided, and they reclaimed the churl with civil rudeness some and shaked him with menace of blandishments others whiles they all chode with him a marine seized the dolt what a devil he would be at thou chuff thou puny thou gotten peas straw thou losel thou chitterling thou spawn of a rebel thou dyke dropped thou abortion thou to shut up his drunken drool out of that like a curse of god ape the good sir leopold that had for his cognizance the flower of quiet Margarine gentle, advising also the time's occasion as most sacred and most worthy to be most sacred. In Horn's house, rest should reign. To be short, this passage was scarce by when Master Dixon of Mary in Eccles, goodly grinning, asked young Stephen what was the reason why he had not decided to take friar's vows, and he answered him obedience in the womb, chastity in the tomb, but involuntary poverty all his days. Master Lenehan at this made return that he had heard of those nefarious deeds, and how, as he heard hereof counted, he had besmirched the lily virtue of a confiding female, which was corruption of minors, and they all intershowed it too, waxing merry and toasting to his fathership. But he said very entirely, it was clean contrary to their suppose, for he was the eternal son and ever virgin. Thereat mirth grew in them the more, and they rehearsed to him his curious rite of wedlock for the disrobing and deflowering of spouses, as the priests use in Madagascar Island, she to be in guise of white and saffron, her groom in white and grain, with burning of nard and tapers, on a bride bed while clerks sung kyries, and the anthem ut noviter sexis omnis corporis mysterium, till she was there unmated. He gave them then a much admirable hymen minim by those delicate poets, Master John Fletcher and Master Francis Beaumont, that is in their maid's tragedy that was writ for a like twining of lovers. To bed, to bed was the burden of it to be played with accompanable consent upon the virginals. An exquisite dulcet epithalame was most mollificative suedency for juveniles amatory, 
whom the odoriferous flambeaux of the paranymphs have escorted to the quadrupedal proscenium of connubial communion well met they were said master dixon joyed but harkee young sir better were they named beaumont and letcher for by my troth of such a mingling much might come young stephen said indeed to his best remembrance they had but the one doxy between them and she of the stews to make shift with in delights amorous for life ran very high in those days and the custom of the country approved with it greater love than this he said no man hath that a man lay down his wife for his friend go thou and do likewise thus or words to that effect saith zarathustra sometimes regius professor of french letters to the university of oxtail nor breathed there ever that man to whom mankind was more beholden bring a stranger within thy power it will go hard but thou wilt have the second best bed orate fratres pro meme tipso and all the people shall say amen remember aaron thy generations and thy days of old how thou settedst little by me and by my word and broadedst in a stranger to my gates to commit fornication in my sight and to wax fat and kick like deshurum therefore hast thou sinned against my light and hast made me thy lord to be the slave of servants return return clan milly forget me not o milesian why hast thou done this abomination before me that thou didst spurn me for a merchant of jallops and didst deny me to the roman and to the indian of dark speech with whom thy daughters did lie luxuriously look forth now my people upon the land of behest even from horeb and from nebo and from pisgah and from the horns of hatton unto a land flowing with milk and money but thou hast suckled me with a bitter milk my moon and my sun thou hast quenched for ever and thou hast left me alone for ever in the dark ways of my bitterness and with a kiss of ashes hast thou kissed my mouth this tenebrosity of the interior he proceeded to say hath not been illumined by the wit of the septuagint nor so much as mentioned for the orient from on high which break hell's gates visited a darkness that was foraneous asue faction monerates atrocities as tully saith of his darling stoics and hamlet his father showeth the prince no blister of combustion this adiaphony in the noon of life is an egypt's plague which in the nights of prenativity and post-mortemity is their most proper ubi and quomodo and as the ends and ultimates of all things accord in some mean and measure with their inceptions and originals that same multiplicit concordance which leads forth growth from birth accomplishing by a retrogressive metamorphosis that minishing and ablation towards the final which is agreeable unto nature so is it with our subsolar being the aged sisters draw us into life we wail batten sport clip clasp sunder dwindle die over us dead they bend first saved from waters of old nile among bulrushes a bed of faciated wattles at last the cavity of a mountain an occulted sepulchre amid the conclamation of the hillcat and the ossifrage and as no man knows the ubicity of his tumulus nor to what processes we shall thereby be ushered nor whether to tophet or to edenville in the like way is all hidden when we would backward see from what region of remoteness the whatness of our whoness hath fetched his wenseness there too punch costello roared out mainly etienne chanson but he loudly bid them lo wisdom hath built herself a house this vast majestic long-established vault the crystal palace of the creator all in apple pie order a penny for him who finds the pea behold the mansion reared by deedle jack see the malt stored in many a refluent sack in the proud cirque of jack john's bivouac a black crack of noise in the street here alack bald back loud on left thor thundered in anger awful the hammer hurler come now the storm that hissed his heart and master lynch bade him 
have a care to flout, and wit wanton as the god self was angered for his helprate and paganry. And he that had erst challenged to be so doughty waxed wan as they might all mark, and shrank together, and his pitch that was before so hot uplift was now a sudden quite plucked down, and his heart shook within the cage of his breast as he tasted the rumor of that storm. Then did some mock and some jeer, and Punch Costello fell hard again to his yale, which Master Lenahan vowed he would do after, and he was indeed but a word and a blow on any the least color. But the braggart boaster cried that an old noble daddy was in his cups, it was much what indifferent, and he would not lag behind his lead. But this was only to die his desperation as cowed he crouched in Horn's Hall. He drank indeed at one draught, to pluck up a heart of any grace, for it thundered long rumblingly over all the heavens so that Master Madden, being godly certain wiles, knocked him on his ribs upon that crack of doom, and Master Bloom, at the braggart's side, spoke to him calming words to slumber his great fear, advertising how it was no other thing but a hubbub noise that he heard, the discharge of fluid from the thunderhead, look you having taken place, and all of the order of a natural phenomenon. But was young Bostard's fear vanquished by Calmer's words? No, for he had in his bosom a spike named bitterness, which could not by words be done away. And was he then neither calm like the one, nor godly like the other? He was neither, as much as he would have liked to be, either. But could he not have endeavored to have found again, as in his youth, the bottle holiness that then he lived withal? Indeed, no, for grace was not there to find that bottle. Heard he then in that clap the voice of the god bring forth, or, what Calmer said, a hubbub of phenomenon? Heard? Why, he could not but hear unless he had plugged him up the tube understanding, which he had not done. For through that tube he saw that he was in the land of phenomenon, where he must for a certain one day die, as he was like the rest, too, a passing show. And would he not accept to die like the rest and pass away? By no means would he, though he must, nor would he make more shows, according as men do with wives, which phenomenon has commanded them to do by the book law. Then wotted he not of that other land which is called Believe on Me, that is the land of promise which behooves to the king delightful, and shall be for ever, where there is no death, and no birth, neither wiving nor mothering, at which all shall come, as many believe on it? Yes, Pius had told him of that land, and Chaste had pointed him to the way, but the reason was that in the way he fell in with a certain whore of an eye-pleasing exterior, whose name, she said, is bird in the hand, and she beguiled him wrong ways from the true path by her flatteries, that she said to him, as, Ho, oh, you pretty man! Turn aside hither, and I will show you a brave place. And she lay at him so flatteringly that she had him in her grot, which is named Two in the Bush, or by some learned carnal concupiscence. This was it what all that company that sat there at commons in manse of mothers the most lusted after, and if they met with this horror bird in the hand, which was within all foul plagues, monsters, and a wicked devil, they would strain the last, but they would make at her and know her. For regarding believe on me, they said it was naught else but notion, and they could conceive no thought of it, for, first, two in the bush, whether she ticed them, was the very goodliest grot, and in it were four pillows, on which were four tickets, with these words printed on them, pick-a-back, and topsy-turvy, and shame-face, and cheek-by-jowl, and, second, for that foul plague, all pox, and the monsters they cared not for them, for preservative had given them a stout shield of ox and gut, and third, that they might take no hurt, neither from offspring that was that wicked devil by virtue of this same shield which was named Kill Child. So were they all in their blind fancy, Mr. Cavill and Mr. Sometimes Godly, Mr. Ape Swillale and Mr. False Franklin, Mr. Dainty Dixon, Young Boasthard, and Mr. Cautious Calmer. Wherein, O oh, wretched company, were ye all deceived, for that was the voice of the god that was in a very grievous rage, that he would presently lift his arm up and spill their souls for their abuses and their spillings done by them, contrarywise to his word, which forth to bring, brenningly biddeth. 
So Thursday, 16th June, Patrick Dignam laid in clay of an apoplexy, and after hard drought, please God, rained. A bargeman coming in by water a fifty mile or thereabout with turf, saying the seed won't sprout, fields a thirst, very sad colored and stunk mightily, the quags and toffs too. Hard to breathe, and all the young quicks clean consumed without sprinkle this long while back, as no man remembered to be without. The rosy buds all gone brown, and spread out blobs, and on the hills naught but dry flag and faggots that would catch at first fire. All the world saying, for aught they knew, the big wind of last February a year, that did havoc the land so pitifully, a small thing beside this barrenness. But by and by, as said, this evening after sundown, the wind sitting in the west, biggest swollen clouds to be seen, as the night increased, and the weather-wise pouring up at them, and some sheet lightnings at first and after, past ten of the clock, one great stroke, with a long thunder, and in a brace of shakes, all scamper pell-mell, within door, for the smoking shower. The men making shelter for their straws with a clout or kerchief, women folk skipping off with kirtles catched up soon as the poor came. In Ely Place, Baggett Street, Duke's Lawn, thence through Marion Green up to Hollis Street, a swash of water flowing that was before bone dry, and not one chair or coach or fiacre seen about, but no more crack after that first. Over against the right honorable Mr. Justice Fitzgibbon's door, that is, to sit with Mr. Healy the lawyer upon the college lands, Mal Mulligan, a gentleman's gentleman that had but come from Mr. Moore's the writers, that was a papish but is now, folks say, a good Williamite, chanced against Alec Bannon in a cut bob, which are now in with dance cloaks of Kendall Green, that was new got to town from Mullingar with the stage where his cuz and Mal M's brother will stay a month yet till St. Swithin, and asks what in the earth he does there, he bound home, and he to Andrew Horn's being stayed for to crush a cup of wine, so he said, but would tell him of a skittish heifer, big of her age, and beef to the heel, and all this while poured with rain, and so both together on to Horn's. There lee up bloom of Crawford's journal, sitting snug with a covey of wags, likely brangling fellows, Dixon June, scholar of my Lady of Mercies, Vin Lynch, a Scots fellow, Will Madden, T. Lenahan, very sad but a racer he fancied, and Stephen D. Leop bloomed there for a languor he had, but was now better, be having dreamed tonight and a fancy strange of his dame Mrs. Mole with red slippers on and a pair of turkey trunks, which is thought by those in ken to be for a change, and Mistress Purefoy there that got in through pleading her belly, and now on the stools, poor body, two days past her term, the midwife sore put to it and can't deliver, she queasy for a bowl of rice slop that is a shrewd dryer up of the insides and her breath very heavy more than good and should be a bully boy from the knocks they say but god give her soon issue tis her ninth chick to live i hear and lady day bit off her last chick's nails that was then a twelve month and with other three all breastfed that died written out in a fair hand in the king's bible her hub fifty odd and a Methodist, but takes the sacrament, and is to be seen any fair Sabbath with a pair of his boys off Bullock Harbor, dapping on the sound with a heavy braked reel, or in a punt he has trailing for flounder and pollock, and catches a fine bag, I hear. In some an infinite great fall of rain, and all refreshed, and will much increase the harvest. Yet those in Ken say, after wind and water, fire shall come for a prognostication of Malachi's almanac. And I hear that Mr. Russell, has done a prophetical charm of the same gist out of the Hindustanish for his farmer's gazette, to have three things in all but this a mere fetch without bottom of reason for old crones and bairns, yet sometimes they are found in the right guess with their queerities no telling how. With this came up Lenahan to the feet of the table to say how the letter was in that night's gazette, and he made a show to find it about him, for he swore with an oath that he had been at pains about it. But on Stephen's persuasion he gave over the search, and was bidden to sit near by, which he did mighty brisk. He was a kind of sport gentleman that went for a merry Andrew or honest pickle, and what belonged of women, horse flesh, or hot scandal, he had it pat. To tell the truth he was mean in fortunes, and for the most part hankered about the coffee houses and low taverns with crimps, ostlers, bookies, Paul's men, runners, flat caps, 
waistcoatiers, ladies of the bagno, and other rogues of the game, or with a chanceable catchpole or a tipstaff, often at nights till broad day, of whom he picked up between his sack possets much loose gossip. He took his ordinary at a boiling cook's, and if he had but gotten into him a mess of broken victuals or a platter of tripes with a bare tester in his purse, he could always bring himself off with his tongue, some randy quip he had from a punk or what not, that every mother's son of them would burst their sides. The other, Costello, that is, hearing this talk, asked was it poetry or a tale. Faith, no, he says, Frank, that was his name, tis all about carry cows that are to be butchered along of their plague. They can go hang, says he with a wink, for me with their bully beef, a pox on it. There's as good fish in this tin as ever came out of it, and very friendly he offered to take of some salty sprats that stood by which he had eyed wishly in the meantime, and found the place which was indeed the chief design of his embassy, as he was sharp set. Mort o vache, says Frank, then in the French language, that had been indentured to a brandy shipper that has a wine lodge in Bordeaux, and he spoke French like a gentleman, too. From a child this Frank had been a doughnut that his father, a headborough, who could ill keep him to school to learn his letters and the use of the globes, matriculated at the university to study the mechanics, but he took the bit between his teeth like a raw colt, and was more familiar with the justiciary and the parish beetle than with his volumes. One time he would be a play-actor, then a sutler or a welsher, then naught would keep him from the bare pit and the cocking mane. Then he was for the ocean sea, or to hoof it on the roads with the Romany folk, kidnapping a squire's heir by favor of moonlight, or fecking maid's linen, or choking chicken behind a hedge. He had been off as many times as a cat has lives, and back again with naked pockets, as many more to his father the headborough, who shed a pint of tears as often as he saw him. What, says Mr. Leopold, with his hands across, that was earnest to know the drift of it, will they slaughter all? I protest, I saw them, but this day morning going to the Liverpool boats, says he. I can scarce believe tis so bad, says he. And he had experience of the like brood beasts, and of springers, greasy hoggets, and weather wool, having been some years before actuary for Mr. Joseph Cuff, a worthy salesmaster that drove his trade for livestock and meadow auctions hard by Mr. Gavin Lowe's yard in Prussia Street. I question with you there, says he, more like tis the hoos or the timber tongue. Mr. Stephen, a little moved, but very handsomely told him no such matter, and that he had dispatches from the emperor's chief tail tickler thanking him for the hospitality that was sending over Dr. Rinderpest, the best-quoted cow-catcher in all Muscovy, with a bolus or two of physic to take the bull by the horns. Come, come, says Mr. Vincent, plain dealing. He'll find himself on the horns of a dilemma if he meddles with a bull that's Irish, says he. Irish by name and Irish by nature, says Mr. Stephen, and he sent the ale purling about, an Irish bull in an English china shop. I conceive you, says Mr. Dixon. It is that same bull that was sent to our island by Farmer Nicholas, the bravest, cattle breeder of them all, with an emerald ring in his nose. True for you, says Mr. Vincent, to cross the table, and a bull's eye into the bargain, says he, and a plumper and a portlier bull, says he, never shit on shamrock. He had horns galore, a coat of cloth of gold, and a sweet smoky breath coming out of his nostrils, so that the women of our island, leaving dough balls and rolling pins, followed after him, hanging his bulliness in daisy chains. What for that, says Mr. Dixon, but before he came over, Farmer Nicholas, that was a eunuch, had him properly gelded by a college of doctors who were no better off than himself. So be off now, says he, and do all my cousin German the Lord Harry tells you, and take a farmer's blessing. And with that he slapped his posteriors very soundly. But the slap and the blessing stood him friend, says Mr. Vincent, for to make up he taught him a trick worth two of the other, so that maid, wife, Abbess and widow to this day affirm that they would rather any time of the month whisper in his ear in the dark of a cow-house or get a lick on the nape from his long holy tongue than lie with the finest strapping young ravisher in the four fields of all Ireland. Another then put in his word, and they dressed him, says he, in a point shift and petticoat with a tippet and girdle and ruffles on his wrists and clipped his forelock 
and rubbed him all over with spermacetic oil and built stables for him at every turn of the road with a gold manger in each full of the best hay in the market so that he could doss and dung to his heart's content. By this time the father of the faithful, for so they called him, was grown so heavy that he could scarce walk to pasture. To remedy which our cozening dames and damsels brought him his fodder in their apron laps, and as soon as his belly was full, he would rear up on his hind quarters to show their ladyships a mystery, and roar and bellow out of him in bull's language, and they all after him. Ay, says another, and so pampered was he that he would suffer not to grow in all the land but green grass for himself, for that was the only color to his mind, and there was a board put up on a hillock in the middle of the island with a printed notice, saying, By the Lord Harry, green is the grass that grows on the ground. And, says Mr. Dixon, if ever he got scent of a cattle raider in Roscommon, or the wilds of Connemara, or a husbandman in Sligo that was sowing as much as a handful of mustard or a bag of rapeseed, out he'd run amuck over half the countryside, rooting up with his horns whatever was planted, and all by Lord Harry's orders. There was bad blood between them at first, says Mr. Vincent, and the Lord Harry called Farmer Nicholas, all the old Nicks in the world, and an old whore-master that kept seven trolls in his house, and all meddle in his matters, says he. I'll make that animal smell hell, says he, with the help of that good pizzle my father left me. But one evening, says Mr. Dixon, when the Lord Harry was cleaning his royal pelt to go to dinner after winning a boat race, he had spayed oars for himself, but the first rule of the course was that the others were to row with pitchforks. He discovered in himself a wonderful likeness to a bull, and on picking up a black-thumbed chapbook that he kept in the pantry, he found sure enough that he was a left-handed descendant of the famous champion Bull of the Romans, Boss Bovum, which is good bog Latin for boss of the show. After that, says Mr. Vincent, the Lord Harry put his head into a cow's drinking trough in the presence of all his courtiers, and pulling it out again told them all his new name. Then with the water running off him he got into an old smock and skirt that had belonged to his grandmother, and bought a grammar of the bull's language to study, but he could never learn a word of it except the first personal pronoun which he copied out big and got off by heart and if ever he went out for a walk, he filled his pockets with chalk to write it upon what took his fancy, the side of a rock or a tea-house table or a bale of cotton or a cork float. In short, he and the bull of Ireland were soon as fast friends as an arse and a shirt. They were, says Mr. Stephen, and the end was that the men of the island, seeing no help was toward, as the ungreat women were all of one mind, made a wary raft, loaded themselves in their bundles of chattels on shipboard, set all masts erect, manned the yards, sprang their luff, heaved to, spread three sheets in the wind, put her head between wind and water, weighed anchor, ported her helm, ran up the Jolly Roger, gave three times three, let the bull gin run, pushed off in their bum boat, and put to sea to recover the main of America. Which was the occasion, says Mr. Vincent, of the composing by a boatswain of that rollicking chanty, Pope Peter's but a piss a bed, a man's a man for all that. Our worthy acquaintance Mr. Malachi Mulligan now appeared in the doorway as the students were finishing their apologue, accompanied with a friend whom he had just re-encountered, a young gentleman, his name Alec Bannon, who had late come to town, it being his intention to buy a color or a cornetcy in the fencibles and list for the wars. Mr. Mulligan was civil enough to express some relish of it all the more as it jumped with a project of his own for the cure of the very evil that had been touched on whereat he handed round to the company a set of pasteboard cards which he had had printed that day at Mr. Quinnell's, bearing a legend printed in fair italics, Mr. Malachi Mulligan, Fertilizer and Incubator. Lambe Island. His project, as he went on to expound, was to withdraw from the round of idle pleasures such as form the chief business of Sir Fopping Popinjay and Sir Milksop Quignunk in town, and to devote himself to the noblest task for which our bodily organism has been framed. Well, let us hear of it, good my friend, said Mr. Dixon. I make no doubt it smacks of wenching. Come, be seated, both. Tis as cheap sitting as standing. Mr. Mulligan accepted of the invitation, and, expatiating upon his design, told his hearers that he had been led into this thought by a consideration of the causes of sterility, both the inhibitory and the prohibitory, whether the inhibition in its turn were due to conjugal vexations or to a parsimony of the balance, as well as whether the prohibition proceeded from defects congenital, 
or from proclivities acquired. It grieved him plaguily, he said, to see the nuptial couch defrauded of its dearest pledges, and to reflect upon so many agreeable females with rich jointures, a prey to the vilest bonzes, who hide their flambeau under a bushel in an uncongenial cloister, or lose their womenly bloom in the embraces of some unaccountable muskin, when they might multiply the inlets of happiness, sacrificing the inestimable jewel of their sex, when a hundred pretty fellows were at hand to caress, this, he assured them, made his heart weep. To curb this inconvenient, which he concluded due to a suppression of latent heat, having advised with certain counsellors of worth and inspected into this matter, he had resolved to purchase in fee simple for ever the freehold of Lambay Island from its holder, Lord Talbot de Malahide, a Tory gentleman of note much in favour with our ascendancy party. He proposed to set up there a national fertilising farm to be named Omphalos, with an obelisk hewn and erected after the fashion of Egypt, and to hold his dutiful yeoman services for the fecundation of any female of what grade of life soever who should there direct to him with the desire of fulfilling the functions of her natural. Money was no object, he said, nor would he take a penny for his pains. The poorest kitchen wench, no less than the opulent lady of fashion, if so be their constructions and their tempers, were warm persuaders for their petitions would find in him their man. For his nutriment he shewed how he would feed himself exclusively upon a diet of savory tubercles and fish and conies there, the flesh of these latter prolific rodents being highly recommended for his purpose, both broiled and stewed with a blade of mace and a pot or two of capsicum chilies. After this homily, which he delivered with much warmth of asseveration, Mr. Mulligan in a trice put off from his hat a kerchief, with which he had shielded it. They both, it seems, had been overtaken by the rain, and for all their mending their pace had taken water, as might be observed by Mr. Mulligan's small clothes of a hodden gray, which was now somewhat piebald. His project, meanwhile, was very favorably entertained by his auditors, and won hearty eulogies from all, though Mr. Dixon of Mary's accepted to it, asking, with a finicking air, did he propose also to carry coals to Newcastle. Mr. Mulligan, however, made court to the scholarly by an apt quotation from the classics, which, as it dwelt upon his memory, seemed to him a sound and tasteful support of his contention. Talis octanta de pravatio hujus seculae o quirites, ut matres familiarum nostre lascivas, cujus libet semiviri libici titillationes, testibus ponderosis atque excelsis erectionibus Centurionum Romanorum Magnopere Ente Ponunt, while for those of ruder wit he drove home his point by analogies of the animal kingdom more suitable to their stomach, the buck and doe of the forest glade, the farmyard drake and duck. Valuing himself not a little upon his elegance, being indeed a proper man of person, this talkative now applied himself to his dress with animadversions of some heat upon the sudden whimsy of the atmospherics while the company lavished their encomiums upon the project he had advanced. The young gentleman, his friend, overjoyed as he was at a passage that had late befallen him, could not forbear to tell it his nearest neighbor. Mr. Mulligan, now perceiving the table, asked for whom were those loaves and fishes, and, seeing the stranger, he made him a civil bow and said, Pray, sir, was you in need of any professional assistance we could give? Who, upon his offer, thanked him very heartily, though preserving his proper distance, and replied that he was come there about a lady, now an inmate of Horn's house, that was in an interesting condition, poor body, from women's woe, and here he fetched a deep sigh, to know if her happiness had yet taken place. Mr. Dixon, to turn the table, took on to ask of Mr. Mulligan himself whether his incipient ventripotence, upon which he rallied him, betokened an ovoblastic gestation in the prostatic utricle or male womb, or was due, as with the noted physician, Mr. Austin Meldon, to a wolf in the stomach. For answer, Mr. Mulligan, in a gale of laughter at his smalls, smote himself bravely below the diaphragm, exclaiming with an admirable droll mimic of Mother Grogan, the most excellent creature of her sex, though tis pity she's a trollop. There's a belly that never bore a bastard. This was so happy a conceit that it renewed the storm of mirth, and threw the whole room into the most violent agitations of delight. 
the spry rattle had run on in the same vein of mimicry, but for some larum in the antechamber. Here the listener, who was none other than the Scotch student, a little fume of a fellow, blond as tow, congratulated in the liveliest fashion with the young gentleman, and, interrupting the narrative at a salient point, having desired his vis-a-vis -vis with a polite beck to have the obligingness to pass him a flagon of cordial waters at the same time by a questioning poise of the head. A whole century of polite breeding had not achieved so nice a gesture, to which was united an equivalent but contrary balance of the bottle, asked the narrator as plainly as was ever done in words if he might treat him with a cup of it. Mais bien sûr, noble stranger, said he cheerily, et mi compliment. That you may end very opportunely. There wanted nothing but this cup to crown my felicity. But gracious heaven was I left with but a crust in my wallet and a cup full of water from the well. My God, I would accept of them and find it in my heart to kneel down upon the ground and give thanks to the powers above for the happiness vouchsafed me by the giver of good things. With these words he approached the goblet to his lips, took a complacent draught of the cordial, slicked his hair, and, opening his bosom, out popped a locket that hung from a silk riband, that very picture which he had cherished ever since her hand had wrote therein. Gazing upon those features with a world of tenderness, Ah, monsieur, he said, had you but beheld her as I did with these eyes at that affecting instant with her dainty tucker and her new coquette cap, a gift for her feast day, as she told me prettily, in such an artless disorder of so melting a tenderness, upon my conscience even you, monsieur, had been impelled by generous nature to deliver yourself wholly into the hands of such an enemy, or to quit the field forever. I declare I was never so touched in all my life. God, I thank thee as the author of my days. Thrice happy will he be, whom so amiable a creature will bless with her favors. A sigh of affection gave eloquence to these words, and, having replaced the locket in his bosom, he wiped his eye and sighed again. Beneficent disseminator of blessings to all thy creatures, how great and universal must be that sweetest of thy tyrannies which can hold and thrall the free and the bond, the simple swain and the polished coxcomb, the lover in the heyday of reckless passion, and the husband of maturer years. But indeed, sir, I wander from the point. How mingled and imperfect are all our sublunary joys. Maledicity, he exclaimed in anguish. Would to God that foresight had but remembered me to take my cloak along. I could weep to think of it. Then, though it had poured seven showers, we were neither of us a penny the worse. But beshrew me, he cried, clapping hand to his forehead, tomorrow will be a new day, and thousand thunders I know of a marchand de capotes, monsieur points, from whom I can have for a livre as snug a cloak of the French fashion as ever kept a lady from wedding. Tut, tut, cries La Ficonne de Tour, tripping in, my friend Monsieur Moore, that most accomplished traveller. I have just cracked a half-bottle avec lui in a circle of the best wits of the town. Is my authority that in Cape Horn, ventre biche, they have a rain that will wet through any, even the stoutest cloak. A drenching of that violence, he tells me, sans blog, has sent more than one luckless fellow in good, earnest post-haste to another world. Pooh! A livre, cries Monsieur Lynch. The clumsy things are dear at a sou. One umbrella, were it no bigger than a fairy mushroom, is worth ten such stop-gaps. No woman of any wit would wear one. My dear Kitty told me today that she would dance in a deluge before ever she would starve in such an ark of salvation, for, as she reminded me, blushing piquantly and whispering in my ear, though there was none to snap her words but giddy butterflies, Dame Nature, by the divine blessing, has implanted it in our hearts, and it has become a household word that il y a du chose, for which the innocence of our original garb, in other circumstances a breach of the proprieties, is the fittest, nay, the only garment. The first, said she, and here my pretty philosopher, as I handed her to the Tilbury to fix my attention, gently tipped with her tongue the outer chamber of my ear, the first is a bath. But at this point a bell tinkling in the hall cut short a discourse which promised so bravely for the enrichment of our store of knowledge. Amid the general vacant hilarity of the assembly, a bell rang, and, while all were conjecturing what might be the cause, Miss Callan entered, and, having spoken a few words in a low tone to young Mr. Dixon, retired with a profound bow to the company. 
the presence even for a moment among a party of debauchees of a woman endued with every quality of modesty and not less severe than beautiful refrained the humorous sallies even of the most licentious but her departure was the signal for an outbreak of ribaldry strike me silly said costello a low fellow who was fuddled a monstrous fine bit of cow flesh i'll be sworn she has rendezvoused you what you dog have you a way with them gad's bud immensely so said mr lynch the bedside manner it is that they use in the mater hospice demi does not dr o'gargle chuck the nuns there under the chin as I looked to be saved, I had it from my kitty who has been ward made there any time these seven months. Locks a mercy, doctor, cried the young blood in the primrose vest, feigning a womanish simper and with immodest squirmings of his body. How you do tease a body. Drat the man. Bless me, I am all of a wibbly wobbly. Why, you're as bad as dear little father can't he kiss him. That you are. May this pot of four half choke me, cried Costello, if she ain't in the family way. I knows a lady what's got a white swelling quick as I claps eyes on her. The young surgeon, however, rose and begged the company to excuse his retreat, as the nurse had just then informed him that he was needed in the ward. Merciful Providence had been pleased to put a period to the sufferings of the lady who was enceinte, which she had borne with a laudable fortitude, and she had given birth to a bouncing boy. I want patience, said he, with those who, without wit to enliven or learning to instruct, revile an ennobling profession which saving the reverence due to the deity is the greatest power for happiness upon the earth i am positive when i say that if need were i could produce a cloud of witnesses to the excellence of her noble exercitations which so far from being a byword should be a glorious incentive in the human breast i cannot away with them what malign such an one the amiable miss callan who is the luster of her own sex and the astonishment of ours and at an instant the most momentous that can befall a puny child of clay perish the thought i shudder to think of the future of a race where the seeds of such malice have been sown and where no right reverence is rendered to mother and maid in house of horn having delivered himself of this rebuke he saluted those present on the by and repaired to the door a murmur of approval arose from all and some were for ejecting the low soaker without more ado a design which would have been effected, nor would he have received more than his bare deserts, had he not abridged his transgression by affirming with a horrid imprecation, for he swore a round hand, that he was as good a son of the true fold as ever drew breath. Stap my vitals, said he, them was always the sentiments of honest Frank Costello, which I was bred up most particular to honor thy father, and thy mother, that had the best hand to a roly-poly or a hasty pudding as you ever see what i always looks back on with a loving heart to revert to mr bloom who after his first entry had been conscious of some impudent mocks which he however had borne with as being the fruits of that age upon which it is commonly charged that it knows not pity the young sparks it is true were as full of extravagancies as overgrown children the words of their tumultuary discussions were difficultly understood and not often nice their testiness and outrageous motes were such that his intellects resiled from nor were they scrupulously sensible of the proprieties though their fund of strong animal spirits spoke in their behalf but the word of mr costello was an unwelcome language for him for he nauseated the wretch that seemed to him a crop-eared creature of a misshapen gibbosity born out of wedlock and thrust like a crookback toothed and feet first into the world which the dint of the surgeon's pliers in his skull lent indeed a color to so as to put him in thought of that missing link of creation's chain desiderated by the late ingenious mr darwin it was now for more than the middle span of our allotted years that he had passed through the thousand vicissitudes of existence and being of a wary ascendancy and self a man of rare forecast he had enjoined his heart to repress all motions of a rising choler and by intercepting them with the readiest precaution foster within his breast that plenitude of sufferance which base minds jeer at rash judgers scorn and all find tolerable and but tolerable to those who create themselves wits at the cost of feminine delicacy a habit of mind which he never did hold with to them he would concede neither to bear the name nor to herit the tradition of a proper breeding, while for such that, 
having lost all forbearance, can lose no more, there remained the sharp antidote of experience to cause their insolency to beat a precipitate and inglorious retreat. Not but what he could feel with mettlesome youth which, caring naught for the mows of dotards or the gruntlings of the severe, is ever, as the chaste fancy of the holder writer expresses it, for eating of the tree forbid it, yet not so far forth as to preterm it humanity upon any condition soever towards a gentlewoman when she was about her lawful occasions. To conclude, while from the sister's words he had reckoned upon a speedy delivery, he was, however, it must be owned, not a little alleviated by the intelligence that the issue so auspicated after an ordeal of such duress now testified once more to the mercy as well as to the bounty of the supreme being. Accordingly he broke his mind to his neighbor, saying that, to express his notion of the thing, his opinion, who ought not perchance to express one, was that one must have a cold constitution and a frigid genius not to be rejoiced by this freshest news of the fruition of her confinement, since she had been in such pain through no fault of hers. The dressy young blade said it was her husband's that put her in that expectation, or at least it ought to be, unless she were another Ephesian matron. I must acquaint you, said Mr. Crothers, clapping on the table so as to evoke a resonant comment of emphasis. Old glory alleyurum was around again today, an elderly man with dundrearies, preferring through his nose a request to have word of Wilhelmina, my life, as he calls her. I bade him hold himself in readiness for that the event would burst anon. Slife, I'll be round with you. I cannot but extol the virile potency of the old bucko that could still knock another child out of her. All fell to praising of it, each after his own fashion, though that same young blade held with his former view that another than her conjugial had been the man in the gap, a clerk in orders, a link boy virtuous, or an itinerant vendor of articles needed in every household. Singular communed the guest with himself, the wonderfully unequal faculty of metempsychosis possessed by them, that the pure apparel, dormitory, and the dissecting theater should be the seminaries of such frivolity, that the mere acquisition of academic titles should suffice to transform in a pinch of time these votaries of levity into exemplary practitioners of an art which most men anywise eminent have esteemed the noblest. But, he further added, it is mayhap to relieve the pent-up feelings that in common oppress them, for I have more than once observed that birds of a feather laugh together. But with what fitness, let it be asked of the noble lord, his patron, has this alien, whom the concession of a gracious prince has admitted to civic rights, constituted himself the lord paramount of our internal polity? Where is now that gratitude which loyalty should have counseled? During the recent war, whenever the enemy had a temporary advantage with his Granados, did this traitor to his kind not seize that moment to discharge his peace against the empire of which he is a tenant at will while he trembled for the security of his four per cents? Has he forgotten this as he forgets all benefits received? Or is it that from being a deluder of others he has become at last his own dupe as he is, if report belie him not, his own and his only enjoyer? Far be it from candor to violate the bedchamber of a respectable lady, the daughter of a gallant major, or to cast the most distant reflections upon her virtue, but if he challenges attention there, as it was indeed highly his interest not to have done, then be it so. Unhappy woman, she has been too long and too persistently denied her legitimate prerogative to listen to his objurgations with any other feeling than the derision of the desperate. He says this, a censor of morals, a very pelican in his piety, who did not scruple, oblivious of the ties of nature, to attempt illicit intercourse with a female domestic drawn from the lowest strata of society. Nay, had the hussy scouring brush not been her tutelary angel, it had gone with her as hard as with Hagar the Egyptian. In the question of the grazing lands, his peevish asperity is notorious, and in Mr. Cuff's hearing brought upon him from an indignant rancher a scathing retort couched in terms as straightforward as they were bucolic. It ill becomes him to preach that gospel. 
Has he not nearer home a seed field that lies fallow for the want of the plowshare? A habit reprehensible at puberty is second nature and an opprobrium in middle life. If he must dispense his balm of Gilead in nostrums and apothegms of dubious taste to restore to health a generation of unfledged profligates, let his practice consist better with the doctrines that now engross him. His marital breast is the repository of secrets which decorum is reluctant to adduce. The lewd suggestions of some faded beauty may console him for a consort neglected and debauched, but this now exponent of morals and healer of ills is at his best an exotic tree which, when rooted in its native orient, throve and flourished, and was abundant in balm, but, transplanted to a clime more temperate, its roots have lost their quondam vigor, while the stuff that comes away from it is stagnant, acid, and inoperative. The news was imparted with a circumspection recalling the ceremonial usage of the sublime porte by the second female infirmarian to the junior medical officer in residence, who in his turn announced to the delegation that an heir had been born. When he had betaken himself to the women's apartment to assist at the prescribed ceremony of the afterbirth, in the presence of the Secretary of State for Domestic Affairs and the members of the Privy Council, silent in unanimous exhaustion and approbation, the delegates, chafing under the length and solemnity of their vigil and hoping that the joyful occurrence would palliate a license which the simultaneous absence of Abigail and obstetrician rendered the easier, broke out at once into a strife of tongues. In vain the voice of Mr. Canvasser Bloom was heard endeavoring to urge, to mollify, to refrain. The moment was too propitious for the display of that discursiveness which seemed the only bond of union among tempers so divergent. Every phase of the situation was successively eviscerated. The prenatal repugnance of uterine brothers, the Caesarean section, posthumity with the respect to the father and that rarer form with respect to the mother, the fratricidal case known as the child's murder and rendered memorable by the impassioned plea of Mr. Advocate Bush, which secured the acquittal of the wrongfully accused, the rights of primogeniture and king's bounty touching twins and triplets, miscarriages and infanticides, simulated or dissimulated, the acardiac fetus in fetu, and aprosopia due to a congestion, the agnathia of certain chinless Chinamen, cited by Mr. Candidate Mulligan, in consequence of defective reunion of the maxillary knobs along the medial line, so that, as he said, one ear could hear what the other spoke, the benefits of anesthesia or twilight sleep, the prolongation of labor pains in advanced gravidancy by reason of pressure on the vein, the premature relentment of the amniotic fluid, as exemplified in the actual case, with consequent peril of sepsis to the matrix, artificial insemination by means of syringes, involution of the womb consequent upon the menopause, the problem of the perpetration of the species in the case of females impregnated by delinquent rape, that distressing manner of delivery called by the Brandenburgers Sturzgebert, the recorded instances of multi-seminal, twi-kindled, and monstrous births conceived during the catamenic period, or of consanguineous parents, in a word, all the cases of human nativity which Aristotle has classified in his masterpiece with chromolithographic illustrations. The gravest problems of obstetrics and forensic medicine were examined with as much animation as the most popular beliefs on the state of pregnancy, such as the forbidding to a gravid woman to step over a country style lest, by her movement, the navel cord should strangle her creature, and the injunction upon her in the event of a yearning, ardently and ineffectually entertained, to place her hand against that part of her person, which long usage has consecrated as the seat of castigation. The abnormalities of hair lip, breast mole, supernumerary digits, negro's inkle, strawberry mark, and port wine stain were alleged by one as a prima facie and natural hypothetical explanation of those swine-headed, the case of Madame Grissel Stevens was not forgotten, 
or dog-haired infants occasionally born. The hypothesis of a plasmic memory advanced by the Caledonian envoy and worthy of the metaphysical traditions of the land he stood for, envisaged in such cases an arrest of embryonic development at some stage antecedent to the human. An outlandish delegate sustained against both these views with such heat as almost carried conviction. The theory of copulation between women and the males of brutes, his authority being his own avouchment in support of fables such as that of the Minotaur, which the genius of the elegant Latin poet has handed down to us in the pages of his Metamorphoses. The impression made by his words was immediate but short-lived. It was effaced as easily as it had been evoked by an allocution from Mr. Candidate Mulligan in that vein of pleasantry which none better than he knew how to effect, postulating as the supremest object of desire a nice clean old man. Contemporaneously, a heated argument having arisen between Mr. Delegate Madden and Mr. Candidate Lynch regarding the juridical and theological dilemma created in the event of one Siamese twin predeceasing the other, the difficulty by mutual consent was referred to Mr. Canvasser Bloom for instant submittal to Mr. Coadjutor Deacon Didalus. Hitherto silent, whether the better to show by preternatural gravity that curious dignity of the garb with which he was invested, or in obedience to an inward voice, he delivered briefly and, as some thought, perfunctorily, the ecclesiastical ordinance forbidding man to put asunder what God has joined. But Malachi's tale began to freeze them with horror. He conjured up the scene before them. The secret panel beside the chimney slid back, and in the recess appeared Haynes. Which of us did not feel his flesh creep? He had a portfolio of Celtic literature in one hand, in the other a file marked Poison. Surprise, horror, loathing were depicted on all faces while he eyed them with a ghostly grin. I anticipated some such reception, he began with an eldritch laugh, for which it seems history is to blame. Yes, it is true. I am the murderer of Samuel Childs, and how I am punished. The Inferno has no terrors for me. This is the appearances on me. Tear and ages, what way would I be resting at all, he muttered thickly, and I tramping Dublin this while back with my share of songs, and himself after me, the like of a sulf or a bullawurus. My hell and Ireland's is in this life. It is what I tried to obliterate my crime. Distractions, rook shooting, the earth's language, he recited some. Loudenum, he raised the file to his lips. Camping out, in vain, his specter stalks me. Dope is my only hope. Ah, destruction, the black panther. With a cry, he suddenly vanished, and the panel slid back. An instant later, his head appeared in the door opposite and said, Meet me at Westland Row Station at ten past eleven. He was gone. Tears gushed from the eyes of the dissipated host. The seer raised his hand to heaven, murmuring, The Vendetta of Mananaun. The sage repeated, Lex Talionis. The sentimentalist is he who would enjoy without incurring the immense debtorship for a thing done. Malachias, overcome by emotion, ceased. The mystery was unveiled. Haynes was the third brother. His real name was Childs. The Black Panther was himself the ghost of his own father. He drank drugs to obliterate. For this relief, much thanks. The lonely house by the graveyard is uninhabited. No soul will live there. The spider pitches her web in the solitude. The nocturnal rat peers from his hole. A curse is on it. It is haunted. Murderer's ground. What is the age of the soul of man? as she hath the virtue of the chameleon to change her hue at every new approach, to be gay with the merry and mournful with the downcast, so too is her age changeable as her mood. No longer is Leopold, as he sits there, ruminating, chewing the cud of reminiscence, that staid agent of publicity and holder of a modest substance in the funds. A score of years are blown away. He is young Leopold, there, as in a retrospective arrangement, a mirror within a mirror. Hey, presto! 
he beholdeth himself. That young figure of then is seen, precociously manly, walking on a nipping morning from the old house in Clanbrasil Street to the high school, his book satchel on him bandolier-wise, and in it a goodly hunk of wheat and loaf, a mother's thought. Or it is the same figure, a year or so gone over, in his first hard hat. Ah, that was the day! Already on the road, a full-fledged traveler for the family firm, equipped with an order book, a scented handkerchief, not for show only. His case of bright trinket wear, alas, a thing now of the past, and a quiver full of compliant smiles for this or that half-one housewife reckoning it out upon her fingertips, or for a budding virgin shyly acknowledging, but the heart, tell me, his studied baisemois, the scent, the smile, but more than these, the dark eyes and oleaginous address brought home at duskfall many a commission to the head of the firm. Seated with Jacob's pipe after like labors in the paternal ingle, a meal of noodles, you may be sure, is a heating. Reading through round horn spectacles some paper from the Europe of a month before. But hey, presto, the mirror is breathed on, and the young knight errant recedes, shrivels, dwindles to a tiny speck within the mist. Now he is himself paternal, and these about him might be his sons. Who can say? The wise father knows his own child. He thinks of a drizzling night in Hatch Street, hard by the bonded stores there, the first. Together she is a poor waif, a child of shame, yours and mine, and of all for a bare shilling and her luck penny. Together they hear the heavy tread of the watch as two rain-caped shadows pass the new royal university. Bridey! Bridey Kelly! He will never forget the name, ever remember the night. First night, the bride night. They are entwined in nethermost darkness, the willer with the willed, and in an instant, fiat, light shall flood the world. Did heart leap to heart? Nay, fair reader, in a breath t'was done, but hold, back, it must not be. In terror the poor girl flees away through the murk. She is the bride of darkness, a daughter of night. She dare not bear the sunny golden babe of day. No, Leopold, name and memory solace thee not. That youthful illusion of thy strength was taken from thee, and in vain. No son of thy loins is by thee. There is none now to be for Leopold what Leopold was for Rudolph. The voices blend and fuse in clouded silence. Silence that is the infinite of space, and swiftly, silently, the soul is wafted over regions of cycles of generations that have lived. A region where gray twilight ever descends, never falls on wide sage-green pasture fields, shedding her dusk, scattering a perennial dew of stars. She follows her mother with ungainly steps, a mare leading her filly foal. Twilight phantoms are they, yet molded in prophetic grace of structure, slim, shapely haunches, a supple, tendinous neck, the meek, apprehensive skull. They fade, sad phantoms. All is gone. Agendath is a wasteland, a home of screech owls and the sand-blind Yupupa. Netayem, the golden, is no more, and on the highway of the clouds they come, muttering thunder of rebellion, the ghosts of beasts. Hua! Hark! Hua! Parallax stalks behind and goads them, the lancinating lightnings of whose brow are scorpions. Elk and Yak, the bulls of Bashan and of Babylon, Mammoth and Mastodon, they come trooping to the sunken sea, Lacus Mortis. Ominous, revengeful, zodiacal host, they moan, passing upon the clouds, horned and capricorned, the trumpeted with the tusked, the lion-maned, the giant antlered, snouter and crawler, rodent, ruminant and pachyderm, all their moving, moaning multitude, murderers of the sun. Onward to the Dead Sea they tramp to drink, unslaked and with horrible gulpings, the salt, somnolent, inexhaustible flood. And the equine portent grows again, 
magnified in the deserted heavens, nay, to heaven's own magnitude, till it looms vast over the house of Virgo. And lo, wonder of metempsychosis, it is she, the everlasting bride, harbinger of the day star, the bride ever virgin. It is she, Martha, thou lost one, Millicent, the young, the dear, the radiant. How serene does she now arise, a queen among the Pleiades, in the penultimate Antelucan hour, shod in sandals of bright gold, quaffed with a veil of what do you call it, gossamer. It floats, it flows about her starborn flesh, and loose it streams, emerald, sapphire, mauve and heliotrope, sustained on currents of the cold interstellar wind, winding, coiling, simply swirling, writhing in the skies a mysterious writing till, after a myriad metamorphoses of symbol, it blazes, alpha, a ruby and triangled sign, upon the forehead of Taurus. Francis was reminding Stephen of years before when they had been at school together in Conmee's time. He asked about Glocan and Alcibiades and Pisistratus. Where were they now? Neither knew. You have spoken of the past and its phantoms, Stephen said. Why think of them? If I call them into life across the waters of Letha, will not the poor ghosts troop to my call? Who supposes it? I, Bus Stephanamunus, bullock befriending bard, am lord and giver of their life. He encircled his gadding hair with a coronal of vine leaves, smiling at Vincent. That answer and those leaves, Vincent said to him, will adorn you more fitly when something more, and greatly more, than a capful of light odes can call your genius father. All who wish you well hope this for you. All desire to see you bring forth the work you meditate, to acclaim you Stephanophoros. I heartily wish you may not fail them. Oh no, Vincent Lenahan said, laying a hand on the shoulder near him. Have no fear. He could not leave his mother an orphan. The young man's face grew dark. All could see how hard it was for him to be reminded of his promise and of his recent loss. He would have withdrawn from the feast had not the noise of voices allayed the smart. Madden had lost five drachmas on scepter for a whim of the rider's name. Lenahan is much more. He told them of the race. The flag fell and, huh, off, scamper. The mare ran out freshly with O. Madden up. She was leading the field. All hearts were beating. Even Phyllis could not contain herself. She waved her scarf and cried, Huzzah! Scepter wins! But in the straight on the run home, when all were in close order, the dark horse throwaway, drew level, reached, outstripped her. All was lost now. Phyllis was silent. Her eyes were sad anemones. Juno, she cried, I am undone. But her lover consoled her and brought her a bright casket of gold in which lay some oval sugar plums which she partook. A tear fell, one only. A whacking fine whip, said Lanahan, is W. Lane. Four winners yesterday and three today. What rider is like him? Mount him on the camel or the boisterous buffalo, the victory in a hack canter is still his. But let us bear it as was the ancient wont. Mercy on the luckless. Poor scepter, he said with a light sigh. She is not the filly that she was. Never by this hand shall we behold such another. By gad, sir, a queen of them. Do you remember her, Vincent? I wish you could have seen my queen today, Vincent said. How young she was and radiant. Lalage was scarce fair beside her. In her yellow shoes and frock of muslin, I do not know the right name of it. The chestnuts that shaded us were in bloom. The air drooped with their persuasive odor and with pollen floating by us. In the sunny patches one might easily have cooked on a stone a batch of those buns with Corinth fruit in them that Periplipopenes sells in his booth near the bridge. But she had naught for her teeth but the arm with which I held her, and in that she nibbled mischievously when I pressed too close. A week ago she lay ill, four days on the couch, but today she was free blithe, mocked at peril. She is more taking, then. Her posies, tool, mad romp that she is, she had pulled her fill as we reclined together. And in your ear, my friend, you will not think who met us as we left the field. Con me himself. He was walking by the hedge, reading, I think, a brevier book, with, I doubt not, a witty letter in it from Glycera or Chloe to keep the page. The sweet creature turned all colors in her confusion, 
feigning to reprove a slight disorder in her dress. A slip of underwood clung there, for the very trees adore her. When Conmee had passed, she glanced at her lovely echo in that little mirror she carries. But he had been kind. In going by, he had blessed us. The gods, too, are ever kind, Lenahan said. If I had poor luck with Bass's mare, perhaps this draft of his may serve me more propensely. He was laying his hand upon a wine jar. Malachi saw it and withheld his act, pointing to the stranger and to the scarlet label. Warily, Malachi whispered, preserve a druid silence. His soul is far away. It is as painful, perhaps, to be awakened from a vision as to be born. Any object, incensely regarded, may be a gate of access to the incorruptible eon of the gods. Do you not think it, Stephen? Theosophus told me so, Stephen answered, whom in a previous existence Egyptian priests initiated into the mysteries of karmic law. The lords of the moon, Theosophus told me, an orange fiery shipload from planet Alpha of the lunar chain would not assume the etheric doubles, and these were therefore incarnated by the ruby-colored egos from the second constellation. However, as a matter of fact, though, the preposterous surmise about him being in some description of a doldrums or other or mesmerized, which was entirely due to a misconception of the shallowest character, was not the case at all. The individual whose visual organs, while the above was going on, were at this juncture commencing to exhibit symptoms of animation, was as astute, if not astuter, than any man living, and anybody that conjectured the contrary would have found themselves pretty speedily in the wrong shop. During the past four minutes or thereabouts, he had been staring hard at a certain amount of number one bass, bottled by Messrs. Bass and Company at Burton-on-Trent, which happened to be situated amongst a lot of others right opposite to where he was, and which was certainly calculated to attract anyone's remark on account of its scarlet appearance. He was simply and solely, as it subsequently transpired for reasons best known to himself, which put quite an altogether different complexion on the proceedings, after the moments before's observations about boyhood days in the turf, recollecting two or three private transactions of his own, which the other two were as mutually innocent of as the babe unborn. Eventually, however, both their eyes met, and as soon as it began to dawn on him that the other was endeavoring to help himself to the thing, he involuntarily determined to help himself, and so he accordingly took hold of the neck of the medium-sized glass recipient, which contained the fluid sought after, and made a capacious hole in it by pouring a lot of it out with, also at the same time, however, a considerable degree of attentiveness in order not to upset any of the beer that was in it about the place. The debate which ensued was in its scope and progress an epitome of the course of life. Neither place nor council was lacking in dignity. The debaters were the keenest in the land, the theme they were engaged on the loftiest and most vital. The high hall of Horn's house had never beheld an assembly so representative and so varied, nor had the old rafters of that establishment ever listened to a language so encyclopedic. A gallant theme and truth it made. Crothers was there at the foot of the table, in his striking highland garb, his face glowing from the briny airs of the mull of Galloway. There, too, opposite to him, was Lynch, whose countenance bore already the stigmata of early depravity and premature wisdom. Next, the Scotchman was the place assigned to Costello, the eccentric, while at his side was seated in stolid repose the squat form of Madden. The chair of the resident indeed stood vacant before the hearth, but on either flank of it the figure of Bannon in explorer's kit of tweed shorts and salted cowhide brogues contrasted sharply with the primrose elegance and town-bred manners of Malachi Roland St. John Mulligan. Lastly, at the head of the board, was the young poet, who found a refuge from his labors of pedagogy and metaphysical inquisition in the convivial atmosphere of Socratic discussion while to right and left of him were accommodated the flippant prognosticator fresh from the hippodrome, and that vigilant wanderer soiled by the dust of travel and combat and stained by the mire of an indelible dishonor, but from whose steadfast and constant heart no lure or peril or threat or degradation could ever efface the image of that voluptuous loveliness which the inspired pencil of Lafayette has limbed for ages yet to come. 
It had better be stated here and now at the outset that the perverted transcendentalism to which Mr. S. Dedalus Divsep contentions would appear to prove him pretty badly addicted runs directly counter to accepted scientific methods. Science, it cannot be too often repeated, deals with tangible phenomena. The man of science, like the man in the street, has to face hard-headed facts that cannot be blinked and explain them as best he can. There may be, it is true, some questions which science cannot answer, at present, such as the first problem submitted by Mr. L. Bloom, Pub Canv, regarding the future determination of sex. Must we accept the view of Empedocles, of Trinacria, that the right ovary, the post-menstrual period, assert others, is responsible for the birth of males, or are the too long neglected spermatozoa or nemosperms the differentiating factor, or is it, as most um, embryologists incline to opine, such as Culpepper, Spallanzani, Blumenbach, Lusk, Hertwig, Leopold, and Valenti, a mixture of both? This would be tantamount to a cooperation, one of nature's favorite devices, between the nicest formativus of the nemosperm on the one hand, and, on the other, a happily chosen position, succubitus felix of the passive element. The other problem raised by the same inquirer is scarcely less vital, infant mortality. It is interesting because, as he pertinently remarks, we are all born in the same way, but we all die in different ways. Mr. M. Mulligan, Heig et Uc Doc, blames the sanitary conditions in which our gray-lunged citizens contract adenoids, pulmonary complaints, etc., by inhaling the bacteria which lurk in dust. These factors, he alleged, and the revolting spectacles offered by our streets, hideous publicity posters, religious ministers of all denominations, mutilated soldiers and sailors, exposed scorbutic car drivers, the suspended carcasses of dead animals, paranoiac bachelors, and unfructified duennas. These, he said, were accountable for any and every falling off in the caliber of the race. Calipedia, he prophesied, would soon be generally adopted, and all the graces of life, genuinely good music, agreeable literature, light philosophy, instructive pictures, plaster-cast reproductions of the classical statues such as Venus and Apollo, artistic colored photographs of prize babies, all these little attentions would enable ladies who were in a particular condition to pass the intervening months in a most enjoyable manner. Mr. J. Crothers, disc back, attributes some of these demises to abdominal trauma in the case of women workers subjected to heavy labors in the workshop and to marital discipline in the home, but by far the vast majority to neglect, private or official, culminating in the exposure of newborn infants, the practice of criminal abortion, or in the atrocious crime of infanticide. Although the former, we are thinking of neglect, is undoubtedly only too true, the case he cites of nurses forgetting to count the sponges in the peritoneal cavity is too rare to be normative. In fact, when one comes to look into it, the wonder is that so many pregnancies and deliveries go off so well as they do, all things considered and in spite of our human shortcomings, which often balk nature in her intentions. An ingenious suggestion is that thrown out by Mr. V. Lynch, back Arith, that both natality and mortality, as well as other phenomena of evolution, tidal movements, lunar phases, blood temperatures, diseases in general, everything in fine in nature's vast workshop from the extinction of some remote sun to the blossoming of one of the countless flowers which beautify our public parks is subject to a law of numeration as yet unascertained. Still the plan of straightforward question why a child of normally healthy parents and seemingly a healthy child and properly looked after succumbs unaccountably in early childhood though other children of the same marriage do not, must certainly, in the poet's words, give us pause. Nature, we may rest assured, has her own good and cogent reasons for whatever she does, and in all probability such deaths are due to some law of anticipation by which organisms in which morbus germs have taken up their residence, modern science has conclusively shown that only the plasmic substance can be said to be immortal, tend to disappear at an increasingly earlier stage of development, an arrangement which, though productive of pain to some of our feelings, notably the maternal, is nevertheless, some of us think, in the long run, beneficial to the race in general, in securing thereby the survival of the fittest. Mr. S. Dedalus, Div Skep, remark, or should it be called an interruption, 
that an omnivorous being which can masticate, deglute, digest, and apparently pass through the ordinary channel with pluter-perfect imperturbability such multifarious ailments as cancerous females emaciated by parturition, corpulent professional gentlemen, not to speak of jaundiced politicians and choleritic nuns, might possibly find gastric relief in an innocent collation of staggering bob, reveals as naught else could, and in a very unsavory light, the tendency above alluded to. For the enlightenment of those who are not so in intimately acquainted with the minutiae of municipal abattoir as this morbid-minded esthete and embryo philosopher, who for all his overweening bumptiousness in things scientific, can scarcely distinguish an acid from an alkali, prides himself on being, it should perhaps be stated that staggering Bob in the vile parlance of our lower class licensed victuallers signifies the cookable and eatable flesh of a calf newly dropped from its mother. In a recent public controversy with Mr. L. Bloom, Pub Canv, which took place in the Commons Hall of National Maternity Hospital, 29, 30, and 31 Hollis Street, of which, as is well known, Dr. A. Horn, licensed in midwifery F.K. Q.C.P.I., is the able and popular master. He is reported by eyewitnesses as having stated that once a woman has let the cat into the bag, an esthete's illusion, presumably, to one of the most complicated and marvelous of all nature's processes, the act of sexual congress, she must let it out again or give it life, as he phrased it, to save her own. At the risk of her own was the telling rejoinder of his interlocutor, none the less effective for the moderate and measured tone in which it was delivered. Meanwhile, the skill and patience of the physician had brought about a happy accouchement. It had been a weary, weary while both for patient and doctor. All that surgical skill could do was done, and the brave woman had manfully helped. She had. She had fought the good fight, and now she was very, very happy. Those who have passed on, who have gone before, are happy too as they gaze down and smile upon the touching scene. Reverently look at her as she reclines there with the mother light in her eyes, that longing hunger for baby fingers, a pretty sight it is to see, in the first bloom of her new motherhood, breathing a silent prayer of thanksgiving to one above, the universal husband. And as her loving eyes behold her babe, she wishes only one blessing more, to have her dear Dodie there with her to share her joy, to lay in his arms that might of God's clay, the fruit of their lawful embraces. He is older now, you and I may whisper it, and a trifle stooped in the shoulders, yet in the whirligig of years a grave dignity has come to the conscientious second accountant of the Ulster Bank, College Green Branch. O oh, Dodie, loved one of old, faithful life-mate now, it may never be again that far-off time of the roses. With the old shake of her pretty head she recalls those days. God, how beautiful now across the mist of years! But their children are grouped in her imagination above the bedside. Hers and his, Charlie, Mary Alice, Frederick Albert, if he had lived, Mamie, Budgie, Victoria Francis, Tom, Violet Constance Louisa, darling little Bobsy, called after our famous hero of the South African War, Lord Bobs of Waterford and Kandahar, and now this last pledge of their union, a Purefoy, if ever there was one, with the true Purefoy nose. Young Hopeful will be christened Mortimer Edward after the influential third cousin of Mr. Purefoy in the Treasury Remembrancer's office, Dublin Castle. And so time wags on, but Father Cronian has dealt lightly here. No, let no sigh break from that bosom, dear gentle Mina, and Dodie, knock the ashes from your pipe, the seasoned briar you still fancy, when the curfew rings for you, may it be the distant day. And doubt the light whereby you read in the sacred book for the oil too has run low, and so with a tranquil heart to bed, to rest. He knows, and will call in his own good time. You too have fought the good fight, and played loyally your man's part. Sir, to you my hand, well done, thou good and faithful servant. There are sins, or, let us call them as the world calls them, evil memories which are hidden away by man in the darkest places of the heart, but they abide there and wait. He may suffer their memory to grow dim, let them be as though they had not been, and all but persuade himself that they were not, or at least were otherwise. Yet a chance word will call them forth suddenly, and they will rise up to confront him in the most various circumstances, a vision or a dream, or while timbrel and harp soothe his senses, 
or amid the cool silver tranquillity of the evening, or at the feast, at midnight, when he is now filled with wine. Not to insult over him will the vision come as over one that lies under her wrath, not for vengeance to cut him off from the living, but shrouded in the piteous vesture of the past, silent, remote, reproachful. The stranger still regarded on the face before him a slow recession of that false calm there, imposed, as it seemed, by habit or some studied trick, upon words so embittered as to accuse in their speaker an unhealthiness, a flare for the cruder things of life. A scene disengages itself in the observer's memory, evoked, it would seem, by a word of so natural a homeliness as if those days were really present there, as some thought, with their immediate pleasures. A shaven space of lawn one soft May evening, the well-remembered grove of lilacs at Round Town, purple and white, fragrant, slender spectators of the game, but with much real interest in the pellets as they run slowly forward over the sward or collide and stop, one by its fellow, with a brief alert shock. And yonder about that gray urn where the water moves at times in thoughtful irrigation, you saw another as fragrant sisterhood, flowy, atty, tiny, and their darker friend with I know not what of arresting in her pose then, Our Lady of the Cherries, a comely brace of them pendant from an ear, bringing out the foreign warmth of the skin so daintily against the cool, ardent fruit. A lad of four or five in linsey woolsey blossom time, but there will be cheer in the kindly hearth when ere long the bowls are gathered and hutched is standing on the urn secured by that circle of girlish fond hands. He frowns a little just as this young man does now, with a perhaps too conscious enjoyment of the danger, but must needs glance at whiles toward where his mother watches from the piazzetta, giving upon the flower close with a faint shadow of remoteness or of reproach, allez verganglish in her glad look. Mark this farther, and remember, the end comes suddenly. Enter that antechamber of birth where the studious are assembled, and note their faces. Nothing, as it seems, there of rash or violent. Quietude of custody, rather, befitting their station in that house, the vigilant watch of shepherds and of angels about a crib in Bethlehem of Judah long ago. But as before the lightning, the serried storm clouds, heavy with preponderant excess of moisture, in swollen masses, turgidly distended, compass earth and sky in one vast slumber, impending above parched field and drowsy oxen and blighted growth of shrub and verdure, till in an instant a flash wreathes their centers, and with the reverberation of the thunder the cloudburst pours its torrent. So, and not otherwise, was the transformation, violent and instantaneous, upon the utterance of the word. Burks outflings my lord Stephen, giving the cry, and a tag and bobtail of all them after, cockerel, jackanapes, welsher, pill doctor, punctual bloom at heels with a universal grabbing of headgear, ash plants, bilbos, Panama hats and scabbards, sermon alpenstocks, and what not. A detail of lusty youth, noble every student there. Nurse Callan, taken aback in the hallway, cannot stay them, nor smiling surgeon coming downstairs with the news of placentation ended, a full pound if a milligram. They hark him on. The door, it is open. Ha! They are out, tumultuously off for a minute's race, all bravely legging it, Burks of Denzil and Hollis their ulterior goal. Dixon follows, giving them sharp language, but raps out an oath, he too, and on. Bloom stays with nurse, a thought to send a kind word to happy mother and nursling up there. Dr. Diet and Dr. Quiet. Looks she, too, not other now? Ward of watching in Horn's house has told its tale in that washed-out pallor. Then, all being gone, a glance of mother wit helping, he whispers close in going, Madam, when comes the stork bird for thee? The air without is impregnated with rain-dew moisture. Life essence celestial, glistening on Dublin stone there under starshiny quellum. God's air, the All Father's air, a scintillant, circumambient, sessile air. Breathe it deep into thee. By heaven, Theodore Purefoy, thou hast done a doughty deed and no botch. 
Thou art, I vow, the remarkablest progenitor, barring none in this chaffering, all including most farraginous chronicle. Astounding! In her lay a God-framed, God-given, pre-formed possibility which thou hast fructified with thy modicum of man's work. Cleave to her, serve, toil on, labor like a very band-dog, and let scholarment and all methusiasts go hang. Thou art all their daddies, Theodore, art drooping under thy load, be moiled with butcher's bills at home, and ingots, not thine, in the counting-house. Head up, for every new begotten thou shalt gather thy homer of ripe wheat. See, thy fleece is drenched. Dost envy Darvy Dolman there with his Joan? A canting jay and a rheumied cur-dog is all their progeny. Pshaw, I tell thee, he is a mule, a dead gastropod, without vim or stamina, not worth a cracked kreutzer. Copulation without population. No, say I, Herod's slaughter of the innocents were the truer name. Vegetables, forsooth, and sterile cohabitation. Give her beefsteaks, red, raw, bleeding. She is a hoary pandemonium of ills, enlarged glands, mumps, quinsy, bunions, hay fever, bed sores, ringworm, floating kidney, derbyshire neck, warts, bilious attacks, gallstones, cold feet, varicose veins. A truce to threens and trentals and jeremies and all such congenital defunctive music. Twenty years of it regret them not. With thee it was not as with many that will and would and wait and never do. Thou sawest thy America, thy life task, and didst charge to cover like the transpontine bison. How saith Zarathustra, Dein ke trubskal melkes du, nun trinkst du dies sush milch des uter. See, it displodes for thee in abundance. Drink, man, and utter full. Mother's milk, purefoy, the milk of human kin. Milk, too, of those burgeoning stars overhead, rutilant in thin rain vapor, punch milk, such as those riders will quaff in their guzzling den, milk of madness, the honey milk of Canaan's land. Thy cow's dug was tough, what? Ay, but her milk is hot and sweet and fattening, no dollop this but thick, rich bonny clabber. To her, old patriarch, pap, per deum partulum et pertudum nunc est bibendum. All off for a buster, Armstrong hollering down the street, bona fides. Where you slept last night, Timothy of the battered nagin, like old Billio. Any brawlies or gum boots in the family? Where the Henry Neville sawbones and old clo? Sara, one of me knows. Hurrah there, dicks, forward to the ribbon counter. Where's Punch? All serene. Jay, look at the drunken minister coming out of the maternity hospital. Bendicat vos omnipotens deus, pater et filius. A make, mister, the Denzil Lane boys. Hell, blast ye! Scoot! Righto, Isaacs, shove him out of the bleeding limelight. Yous join us, dear sir? No intrusion in life. Lou heap good man. Ali samey dis bunch. And avant, mes enfants. Fire away number one on the gun. Burks! Burks! Thence they advanced five parasangs. Slattery's mounted foot. Where's that bleeding arfer? Parson Steve apostate's creed. No, no, Mulligan, abaft there, shove ahead. Keep a watch on the clock. Chucking out time. Mully, what's on you? Ma mer, ma Maria. British Beatitudes. Rentum platin diggity boom boom. Eyes have it. To be printed and bound at the Druid Drum Press by two designing females. Calf covers of pissed on green. Last word in art shades. Most beautiful book come out of Ireland my time. Silentium. Get a spurt on. Tension. Proceed to nearest canteen and there annex liquor stores. March! Tramp, tramp, tramp. The boys are attitudes. Parching. Beer, beef, business, Bibles, bulldogs, battleships, buggery, and bishops. Whether on the scaffold high. Beer, beef, trample the Bibles. When for Ireland, dear. Trample the tramplers. Thunderation. Keep the darned military step. We fall. Bishop's booze box. Halt. Heave to. Rugger. Scrum in. No touch kicking. Wow, my tootsies. You hurt? Most amazingly sorry. Query. Who's a-standing this here do? Proud possessor of damall. Declare misery. Bet to the ropes. Me nanty salty. Not a red at me this week gone. Yours? 
Meat of our fathers for the Ubermensch. Ditto. Five number ones. You, sir? Ginger cordial. Chase me the cabbie's caudle. Stimulate the caloric. Winding of his ticker. Stop short, never to go again when the old. Absinthe for me, savvy. Caramba, have an eggnog or a prairie oyster. Enemy? Avuncular's got my timepiece. Ten two. Obligated, awful. Don't mention it. Got a pectoral trauma, eh, Dix? Post fact. Got bet be a boomblebee whenever he was settin' sleepin' in his bit garden. Digs up near the mater. Buckle he is. No is, don't I? Yep, sartin' I do, full of a doer. See her in her dishy, Billy. Peels off a credit. Lovely, lovekin. None of your lean kind, not much. Pull down the blind, love. Two artelones. Same here. Look slippery. If you fall, don't wait to get up. Five, seven, nine. Fine. Got a prime pair of mince pies, no kid. And her take me to rest in her anchor of rum. Must be seen to be believed. Your starving eyes and all be plastered neck, you stole my heart, O oh glue pot. Sir, spud again the rheumatiz? All poppycock, you'll excuse me saying. For the hoi polloi, I veer thee beast a girt vool. Well, doc? Back fro Lapland, your corporosity sagaciating okay? How's the squaws and papooses? Woman body after going on the straw? Stand and deliver. Password. There's hair. Ours the white death and the ruddy birth. Hi, spit in your own eye, boss. Mummer's wire. Cribbed out of Meredith. Jessified, orchidized, polychemical Jesuit. Anti-mines writing Pa Kinch. Batty bad Stephen. Lead astray, goody good Malachi. Haroo! Collar the leather, young'un. Round with a nappy. Here, jock bra, Heintelman's your barley brie. Lang may your lum reek and your kale pot boil. My tipple. Merci. Here's to us. How's that? Leg before wicket. Don't stain my brand new sitnums. Gives a shake of peppy, you there. Catch a holt. Caraway seed to carry away. Twig? Shrieks of silence. Every cove to his gentry mort. Venus pendemos. Le petite femme. Bold, bad girl from the town of Mullingar. Tell her I was axing at her. Hoding Sarah by the wame. On the road to Malahide. Me? If she who seduced me had left but the name. What do you want for ninepence? Macri, Macruskeen, smutty mole for a mattress jig. And a pull altogether. X. Waiting, Governor? Most deciduously. Bet your boots on. Stunned like, seeing as how no shiners is a comin'. Under constumble? Have got the chink ad lib. Seed near free pound on in a spell ago and said war hisn. Us come right up on your invite, see? Up to you, matey. Out with the oof. Two bar and a wing. You larn that go off of there, them Frenchy bilks? Won't wash here for nuts, no how. Little child, veli solly. Eyes the cutest color coon down our side. God's to Ruth, Charlie. We are nay foo. We are nay the foo foo. Our reservoir, musu. Thanks you. Tis sure, what say? In the speakeasy. Tight. I she you sure. Bantam, two days, t t. Bosing, nout, but clair twine. Garn, have a glint, do. Come, I'm jiggered. And been to Barbary, ev. Too full for words, with a railway bloke. How come you so? Opera, he'd like? Rose of Castile. Rose of Cast. Police! Some H2O for a gent fainted. Look at Bantam's flowers. Gemini, he's going to holler. The Colleen Bon. My Colleen Bon. Oh, cheese it. Shut his blurry Dutch oven with a firm hand. Had the winner today till I tipped him a dead cert. The roughen cly the nab of Stephen Hand has give me the jatty coupleen. He strike a telegram boy paddock wire big bug bass to the depot. Shove him a joey and gramwise. Mare on form hot order. Guinea to a goose gog. Telegram that. Gospel true. Criminal diversion? I think that, yes. Sure thing. Land him in choky choky if the harm and back cop the game. Madden back maddens a maddening back. Oh, lust our refuge and our strength. Decamping. Must you go? Off to Mammy. Stand by. Hide my blushes, someone. All in if he spots me. Come home, our bantam. Horivar, mong view. Dinna forget the cowslips for her cell. Cornfide. What give ye then colt? Pal to pal. Janik. Of John Thomas, her spouse. No fake, old man Leo. Selt me honest injun. Shiver my timbers if I had. There's a great big holy friar. Buy for you no tell me. Vell I sees. If that ain't a sheeny Natchez, vell I will get Misha Mishina. Thought you our lord. Amen. You move a motion? Steve, boy, you're going at some. 
More bluggy drunkables? Well, immensely splendiferous standard permit, one stutter of most extreme poverty, and one large-sized grandacious thirst to terminate one expensive inaugurated libation? Give us a breather. Landlord, landlord, have you good wine, Stebu? Hoots, man, a wee drop to pre. Cut and come again. Right. Boniface, absinthe a lot. Nos omnes biberimus viridum toxicum diabolus capiat posterioria nostria. Closing time, gents, eh? Rome boost for the bloom toff. I hear you say onions. Blue cadges ads. Photos papily by all that's gorgeous. Play low, partner. Slide. Bonsoir la campagne. And snares of the pox fiend. Where's the buck in Namby Amby? Skunked? Leg bale. A wheel, ye mon in gang your gates. Checkmate. King to tower. Kind Christiane, will you help young man whose friend took bungalow key to find please where to lay crown of his head tonight? Crikey, I'm about sprung. Tarnally, doggone my shins at this be the bestest, puttiest long break yet. Item, curate, couple of cookies for this child. Cuts, plude, and prandy paws. None. Not a pint of cheeses. Thrust syphilis down to hell and with him those other licensed spirits. Time, gents, who wander through the world. Health all, a la vôtre. Golly, what in tunkets, yon guy in the Macintosh. Dusty roads, peep at his wearables. By mighty, what's he got? Jubilee mutton. Bovril by James, wants it real bad. Ye can bear socks? Seedy cussin' the Richmond? Raw there, thought he had a deposit of lead in his penis. Trumpery insanity. Bartle the bread, we calls him. That, sir, was once a prosperous sit. Man all tattered and torn that married a maiden all forlorn. Slung her hook, she did. Here see lost love. Walking Macintosh of Lonely Canyon. Tuck and turn in. Schedule time. Nix for the hornies. Pardon? Seen him today at a runafall? Chum yorn passed in his checks? Let a massy. Poor pickaninnies. There'll be no telling me that, pulled veg. Didums blubble blig splash cry tears cause from pen he was took off in black bag? Of all the darkies, Massa Pat was the very best. I never see the like since I was born. Tian, tian, but it is well sad. That, my faith, yes. Oh, get, rev on a gradient one and nine. Live axle drives are souped. Lay you two to one, Janatsi licks him ruddy well hollow. Jappies? High angle fire, nya. Sunk by war specials. Be worse for him, says he, nor any Russian. Time all, there's eleven of them. Get ye gone. Forward, woozy wobblers. Night, night, may Allah the excellent one your soul this very night ever tremendously conserve. Your attention, we're nay the foo. The leith police dismisseth us. The least tholice, where hawks for the chap puking, unwell in his abominable regions. Yuka, night, Mona, my true love. Yuk, Mona, my own love. Ook, hark, shut your obstropolis. Flap, flap. Blaze on, there she goes. Brigade, bout ship, Mount Street Way. Cut up, flap. Tally ho, you not come? Run, skelter, race, flap. Lynch, hey, sign on long of me. Denzil Lane this way. Change here for body house. We too, she said, will seek the kips where Shady Mary is. Right-o, any old time. Lite buntur in cubilibus, Suisse. You coming long? Whisper, who the sooty hells the Johnny and the black duds? Hush, sinned against the light, and even now that day is at hand when he shall come to judge the world by fire. Flap! Ut implerentur scripturi. Strike up a ballad. Then out spake medical Dick to his comrade, medical Davy. Christical, who's this excrement yellow gospeler on the Marion Hall? Elijah is coming, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, you wine-fizzling, gin-sizzling, booze-guzzling existences. Come on, you doggone, bull-necked, beetle-browed, hog-jowled, peanut-brained, weasel-eyed, four-flushers, false alarms, and excess baggage. Come on, you triple-extractive infamy. Alexander J. Christ Dowie, that's my name, that yanked to glory most half this planet from Frisco Beach to Vladivostok. The deity ain't no nickel-dime bum show. I put it to you that he's on the square in a corking fine business proposition. He's the grandest thing yet, and don't you forget it. Shout the salvation in King Jesus. You'll need to rise precious early, you sinner there, if you want to diddle the almighty God. Flap! Not half. 
He's got a cough mixture with a punch in it for you, my friend, in his back pocket. Just you try it on.